Hey there, Sooner Nation. Last we talked to you, we were planning on covering a football game in Morgantown, West Virginia. And of course, I'm sure you don't need us to inform you at this point that there was no football game in Morgantown, West Virginia this past weekend. John, Oklahoma had plans to travel up north to take on the Mountaineers at Milan Pushker Stadium. Lo and behold, the Mountaineers have to pause football operations due to a COVID-19 outbreak. And for the fifth time this season, Oklahoma has an open date. That's crazy. Isn't that crazy? Uh, and I, I'm, first off, let's, 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 talk, let's talk about me since this is my podcast and your podcast. Let's talk about me. All right. I'm so disappointed. I don't get to go to Morgantown this year. My wife asked me yesterday, so are you disappointed? And I'm like watching college football on TV and laying around the house. I was like, I'm a little disappointed. I'm a little disappointed. It's always a fun trip for Oklahoma, or for anybody in the Big 12, to get to go to Morgantown, fly into Pittsburgh, drive through the mountains, hang out in a mountainous city with some crazy moonshine drinking folks. But not this year. I exchanged some emails with some people that are like, we'll see you in two years. I'm like, golly, that stinks. That is John Hoover. I am Parker Thune, and you are listening to and or watching, depending on the platform, the SI Sooners podcast, which we do twice a week for your listening and or watching enjoyment. And of course, we focus on all things Oklahoma athletics, which of course at this time of year is a lot of football. There's usually a lot more football than there has been this season. As we mentioned, five open dates for Oklahoma. And now the second time that they have gone into a game week in preparation for West Virginia and have ended up not playing West Virginia on that particular weekend. So Lincoln Riley and his crew get an off week before taking on Iowa State for the Big 12 championship. The Cyclones, of course, also had a bye this past week. Theirs was planned. Oklahoma's obviously was not. Now, John, Lincoln Riley emphasized it over and over and over again in press conferences last week leading up to what we thought was going to be a road tilt with the Mountaineers. He said, we need to play games. We need all the experience we can get right now. We need our guys in game situations in order to be ready for that grudge match against Iowa State when we walk into AT&T Stadium and take them on in Jerry's world on December 19th. Well, they didn't get that opportunity. And with the way that the team has looked over the last four games, you would imagine that it's not going to be much of a bump in the road for them in terms of their preparation. However, you do have to kind of be concerned just with how much Riley continued to pound the table and say, we need to be on the field this weekend. You got to be somewhat concerned that they didn't, in fact, get to be on the field this past weekend. Yeah, Parker, their last time out was not very sharp against Baylor. So, and we're talking offensively here, first of all. But, but uh, man, that's – yeah, I, th I think that's got to be a concern because the way you described it is exactly right. Lincoln Riley basically pounded the table and said, this is a game we have to play. We have to get better. We have to get sharper. We have to work on the things that we didn't do right against Baylor. Coming off a little bit of a lull. So, now you go off of that into practicing for most of the week against West Virginia – only to learn that you're not playing West Virginia. You've wasted half a week. Meanwhile, West, uh, meanwhile, Iowa State has been practicing for Oklahoma. They've been game planning and, and prepping for Oklahoma for two weeks. So a little bit of a disparity there. A little, Sooners a little bit behind the eight ball. I think Oklahoma is has been the last half of the season playing at a higher level than Iowa State. But, man, look what Iowa State just did to West Virginia. 42-6 to six, just dismantled them in, in Ames. This is something that uh, I would think is a real concern for Lincoln Riley and for the Sooners, um, especially especially coming off of heavy COVID numbers uh, the week before that got bumped when they had to cancel, when OU had to cancel. Your offensive coaching staff has been a little bit decimated. So, yeah, there's some – There's it's just – it's so herky-jerky, and it's so start and stop that I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, and I, I think Oklahoma is going to try and put their best foot forward on Saturday. Good luck with that. It's going to be tough. Now, John, as our regulars are aware, we do these podcasts Wednesday and Sunday. Now, we found out that the game was canceled Thursday morning. So, of course, we haven't gotten a chance to discuss it here on the podcast as of yet. But just about an hour after the game was officially canceled per both schools and the Big 12 on Thursday morning, you got the chance to catch up with Lincoln Riley along with a few other beat writers and get his reaction to the news. 
And one of your colleagues on the beat, John, one of our colleagues, I should say, um, asked Lincoln Riley what he would do if Ryan Day and Ohio State called and asked if they would like to schedule a game for that coming Saturday. Riley's answer was very short, very concise, very simple. He said, we would play. That's how badly Lincoln Riley wanted to be on the field this Saturday, John, that if the number five team in the nation, number four, depending on which poll you use, one of the top five teams in the nation called and said that they wanted to take on Oklahoma, Lincoln Riley would absolutely unashamedly and without a second thought engage them in that opportunity. What does that suggest to you, John? Um, a couple things. One, um, David Littlejohn, the equipment manager, was on his way, had the big truck. He was had the, all the, the OU 18-wheeler rolling down the highway and uh, had to turn it around, at, I think, in Terre Haute, Indiana, around there, somewhere in Indiana. And, uh, you know, Columbus is just about four more hours up the road. So maybe they would have gotten on a plane and flew to Columbus instead of Morgantown. Probably not, if you think about it. Um, the reality is this. The Ohio State and Big Ten can't play out of conference games this year. That's what the that's the rule they made. They would probably amend that rule for the benefit of Ohio State. If Ohio State called Kevin Warren, the Big, Tw Big Ten commissioner, and said, we need to play a game against Oklahoma, he would probably relent. But the reality, such as it was on Thursday, was this. Um, you ask a college football coach, what if Nick Saban calls and wants to play? What if... Bill Belichick calls and gets the old gang together, Gronk and Tom Brady and, and Randy Moss and all those guys, and they want to play like in 15 minutes. What are you going to do? A college football coach, especially one of Lincoln Riley's stature, is going to double up his fists and roll up his sleeves, and he's going to look right in the camera, and he's going to say, we would play, knowing full well that there's 0% chance that he would actually play. That's kind of what happened the other day. Yeah, what's Lincoln Riley going to do? What, what would you do if, if Ryan Day called? What's what's he what's he gonna say? Oh man, we're not gonna play Ohio State. Are you kidding me? They're too good. Uh, I don't think we could get that game in. It's too uh, it's too short of a notice. Uh, we no anything he would say other than we would play would look like he's chickening out. Um, and he took the right tact. And it, what's funny is you go on to the comments section, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Twitter, whether it's any other social media platform, you go to the comments section and you see OU fans saying. Come on, Ryan Day, what are you, scared? It was hilarious. So uh, it's a good time. Made for good conversation, for sure. And we set a record for traffic that day. Way to go, Lincoln Riley. Well, hey, if we've learned anything over the last week is that Ohio State is the Big Ten's <laughs> golden boy, and they'll bend the rules just about any which way to make yep. sure the Buckeyes get what they want slash need. Uh, but, John, we all assume, I shouldn't say we all assume, we're all very aware that Oklahoma and Iowa State will be matched up for the Big 12 championship this weekend. However, there is still a scenario in which Oklahoma and Iowa State don't match up for the Big 12 championship, in which another team enters the waters, if that's what you want to refer to it as. But there is a situation in which the Sooners or the Cyclones could end up on the outside looking in. Now, let's be clear here. This will not happen. Neither school would allow this to happen. But... If there were a situation in which one of the two programs had a COVID-19 outbreak and was unable to play under the Big 12 guidelines this Saturday, the game would not be rescheduled. Regardless of whether it was Oklahoma or Iowa State, the team that could not take the field would be replaced with the third place team in the Big 12, which is, wait for it, Texas. John, how much would you like to see and Oklahoma-Texas round two in the Big 12 championship. I will take a hard pass on that one. Big time. Big time, because I think uh, Iowa State has earned their spot in the Big 12 championship. They're the, they've been the best team in the Big 12 this year. And uh, whereas I think last year there was a, a you know split and uh, you know a tie for first place and like a four-way tie for second place, this year that ain't it. Iowa State has virtually run away with the first place uh, seed, if you will, in the Big 12 championship game. So, man, come on. That's just, no. Um, is it the Big 12 kowtow to, kowtowing to, uh, to Texas? No, not necessarily, because if it was Oklahoma State, 
they would be in the same situation. But yeah, man, a tweet by Ralph Russo, the Associated Press College football sports writer, basically. He he called a bunch of conferences and says what it will, said what are the scenarios, and the Big Twelve scenario was, well, if both Oklahoma and Iowa State can't play, we'll cancel the game. But if only one of them can't play, we're gonna invite the third place team. Man, that is has has that not got farce written all over it? When you when you say our our top two teams can't play, so we're gonna invite some third stringer, some uh, also ran. I know win place and show, but in this case, you're an also ran. You don't place in the money in the championship game. You are an also ran, and you do not deserve to play in the championship game. What you do, Big Twelve, is you declare. One of those two teams, basically, you call it a no contest. I'm sorry, you take your you take your financial hit, whatever the whatever the total number of uh, dollars is that you you stand to make off of this from TV and and attendance and marketing and and branding and all that other stuff. You take your financial hit, you call off the game, and you do the right thing, and you award Iowa State the regular season championship, and you send them on to the college football playoff or the New Year's Six Bowl or whatever the uh, the Champions Bowl, is, as it used to be called, the Sugar Bowl. Um, but this year, of course, it would be not the Sugar Bowl because that's one of the playoff games. Anyway, you don't gum up the works with just three or four days, five days, six days left in the season, Big 12. You've been out in front of this thing the whole season. You've been out in front of making great decisions the whole entire season, from the preseason, from the summer on. Don't screw it up now by inviting Texas to this party. John, can't be messing with people's bottom lines. The dollar signs are the most important thing at the end of the day for these people that call the shots from their corporate offices. I think we're all very aware of that. But no, there, there's going to be a lot of hype coming into this game on both sides. And both teams are going to be really, really eager to take this to take their opponent on uh, and play this game on Saturday because I've been saying it for months John I said it the day after Oklahoma lost to Iowa State in Ames if by some minor miracle the Sooners ended up playing for the Big 12 championship in December Iowa State was the team that they would want to see because it was pretty clear that that Kansas State victory was a fluke but they got outplayed by the Cyclones they did and it had to have been threatening to Lincoln Riley and company to watch another Big 12 team outpaced them on both sides of the football for 60 minutes. And though Iowa State fell behind early on, they were decidedly the better team on that day. And you look at Iowa State, a program that doesn't have a conference championship, John, in over a century. Creighton has won a conference championship in football more recently than Iowa State. Think about that one. Now, Iowa State is playing for a Big 12 title for the first time in program history. They've never even made the Big 12 championship game. This is Matt Campbell's chance to break through. This is Matt Campbell's chance to maybe make the case and be able to assert that he's the best coach in the Big 12 right now. Because if he can go validate his program's victory over Lincoln Riley and the Sooners on Saturday and beat Oklahoma for the second time in a season, then you look at things and you say, okay, maybe the tides have turned in the Big 12. Maybe he's building something legitimate at Iowa State. And Iowa State does not recruit nearly as well as Texas or Oklahoma or Oklahoma State or even TCU in Kansas. Yet here they are in position to make some noise in the college football playoff race. Think about that. They're number seven in the country right now. If they beat Oklahoma on Saturday, they could very well be in the mix for a college football playoff berth. Coming up next on the SI Sooners podcast, we all figured one head coach in the Big 12 was on his way out, but he'll be back for another year. There is one Big 12 quarterback that is definitively on his way out. We'll talk about both individuals coming up next. Trade Pros Heat and Air in Oklahoma City. Whether you just need service or a mini split for your home office, studio, or man cave, or if you're finally ready to upgrade to a more efficient train system for your entire home, get a free estimate from Trade Pros for all your heating and air needs. Trade Pros earned a Best of 2020 award from Home Advisor and has nothing but five star reviews on Google. Go to tradeprosokc.com or call 405 675 0176. Or just book your appointment on Facebook. Trade Pros, that's one word. Trade Pros, heat and air.
you want to hit either John or myself up on social media, he is at John E. Hoover on Twitter. I am at Parker Thune. You can follow John on Facebook, John E. Hoover Media. I am on Instagram if you're into that sort of thing, at Parker Thune as well. And of course, you can follow all Sooners on Twitter at all underscore Sooners. You can check out all the content that we're pushing out on a daily basis on allsooners.com, a Fan Nation affiliate and part of the SI Network. Did I say that right, John? Did I get the new spiel down? You said it right. Perfect. Absolutely. You said it perfectly. Yeah. SI, all Sooners, Fan Nation, we're somewhere in the middle of this love triangle, I suppose. But... Uh, We are cranking out stories, cranking out videos, cranking out podcasts every single day for you over on allsooners.com. So check it out, especially leading into a big, big week for the Sooner football program as they pursue their sixth consecutive Big 12 championship. Now, John, as the Sooners, as I mentioned, go for Big 12 championship number six. It's a lot more than six, but sixth in a row. Their chief rival down south of the border the Oklahoma-Texas border, that is, south of the Red River, Tom Herman and the Texas Longhorns, they, I mean, we just discussed it. They need one of the teams to be ineligible due to COVID-19 guidelines to have a chance to play for the conference championship, which isn't happening. So for the fourth (laughs) time in four years. He's going to send typhoid Mary to Norman is what he's going to do. Texas Texas fans are no doubt rooting for COVID-19. That's what 2020 has come to. (laughs) Now, Tom Herman... There was a lot of rumors swirling about his job security after they lost to Iowa State the day after Thanksgiving. Fourth time in four years that Texas will not win a conference championship. They've only played in one conference championship under Herman, that coming in 2018 when Oklahoma defeated them 39-27 in the Red River rematch in Arlington. Uh, December 1st, I believe, of that year, December 1st, 2018, the Sooners exacted their revenge with Kyler Murray at the helm. But that's the closest that Herman has come to leading Texas to the proverbial promised land. They would not have made the college football playoff that year, but they would have made a New Year's Six Bowl as the automatic rep. Of course, they ended up making a New Year's Six Bowl anyway and defeating Georgia. But Tom Herman has underwhelmed, I think, in the eyes of the Texas fan base, And there were quite a few people across social media and elsewhere, quite a few people in the Texas camp that wanted Tom Herman gone after that loss to Iowa State. Well, Texas Athletic Director Chris Del Conte came out over the weekend and essentially said Tom Herman is our coach in 2021. It'll be the last year of his contract, so it's a prove-it year for Herman. Either he turns this ship around or he's gone one year from now. John, what do you think of the decision to bring Herman back when it looked for all the world like this program was going in a different direction with their head coach? Yeah, man. Texas, we've talked about this before, Parker, and that is Texas doesn't pay five and a half, six million dollars a year to its head coach to go 31 and 18, which is what he is right now. Um, and, and one in four, I think, against Oklahoma. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's underachieving if you're the Texas coach, no matter who you are. So... Bringing him back, I don't think was Chris Del Conte's first option, like his plan A. I think his plan A was to bring Urban Meyer in. You see all the reporting coming out of Austin that had conversations with Urban Meyer, not necessarily an interview with Urban Meyer. Urban Meyer decides at some point during the process that he would rather not coach the Longhorns. Uh, he talked about assist, apparently, or or those around him, maybe I should say, talked to the reporters out of Austin about assist on his brain. You know, he's re- retired because of health reasons a couple of times now. I don't know. Maybe he's waiting for a better job that is not going to take such a toll on him. Maybe he knows that uh, being the head coach at Texas is is going to take a toll on his health and his family. Um, maybe he knows that the culture is broken at Texas and that being there, yeah, he could probably turn it around, but is it really worth it? He's kind of got his legacy going, you know, national championships at multiple schools. He's Urban Meyer. He's Urban freaking Meyer. Does he really need to take on the Texas job? I mean, you know, Fox is paying him some pretty good money to to sit in that studio and not coach football. And he's really good at it. You know, a lot of, a lot of pundits, a lot of 
uh, critics, media critics, are saying that he's really good at it. I think he brings a lot to the broadcast. Maybe he's just gotten comfortable. So no Urban Meyer. Scratch that one, Chris Del Conte. What is plan B? You're going to go out and get one of those um, mid-level, mid-major coaches who's having a 9-1, 10-0 season? Are they going to cut the mustard at Texas? You know, just because the guy's doing great, Luke Fickle at Cincinnati, is he going to be able to roll it over and, and kick some real butt at Texas? Is he going to be able to take it away from Oklahoma? I, I don't think there's a lot of guys who can do that, who could step into that job in that town for that university and work for that fan base and end up kicking Lincoln Riley's butt and, and pushing the rest of the Big 12 back. You know, since that, since uh, Colt McCoy got hurt in the national championship game in 2009, 2010, January season, hurt his shoulder. Since that time, they've got Texas has the seventh best record in the Big 12 conference. Does Urban Meyer want that? No, but Tom Herman does, and so it's Tom. It's on Tom Herman's plate. By the way, the the comment from Chris Del Conte, who t- just take a couple steps back, he goes out of his way during the during the regular season to compliment the women's basketball coach, the volleyball coach, the swim coach during the season. Boy, what a win for our team! Boy, what a performance by our coaching staff! Boy, what a he's the biggest Texas cheerleader there is, and he should be. Radio silence out of him, out of Chris Del Conte, regarding Tom Herman the last four or five weeks of the season. Uh, it's just bad karma all the way around, man. It's bad, bad juju. And uh, for him to come out and put that commentary out, that, that one little paragraph that says Tom Herman is our coach. Not Tom Herman will be our coach in 2021. Not Tom Herman has a contract and will be here through the life of his contract. No, Tom Herman is our coach. Yeah, okay, I got that off the website, CDC. I got that off the website, okay? Um, didn't need you to put out a commentary to say that Tom Herman is your coach. That, what a weird situation. And you know what? It's typical Texas. If there's drama, if there's weirdness, if there's people walking around like, what the hell is going on? Then it's Texas. Now, Del Conte's statement, as you noted, John, for a guy reaffirming his commitment to his head football coach, it was about as non-committal as it gets. Now, yeah. interesting news out of Waco this morning. Charlie Brewer, the senior quarterback of the Baylor Bears, who lost his job, supposedly, it appears that way, yesterday uh, in a completely one-sided loss to Oklahoma State. That game was never close. Uh, but the Bears rolled with Jacob Zeno for the second half of that game. It looks for all the world uh, like there's no room for Brewer anymore with Zeno, a fan favorite, and Kyron Drones coming in, one of the best quarterbacks in the 2021 class. So Brewer's kind of the odd man out, even as a senior, and even given all that he's done as a Baylor Baron. Let's give Charlie Brewer his due here, John. That guy came to Baylor in the wake of, and I mean the thick of, the aftermath of the sexual assault scandal that rocked that university. The football program was in a very, very bad place. His freshman year, they went 1-11. and It was Matt Rule's year, first year as head coach. And then those two, in conjunction with each other, Brewer and Rule, led one of the most dramatic and most remarkable turnarounds that we have seen from any program at the collegiate level over the last few years. They went from 1-11 and to within a whisper of a college football playoff berth in two seasons. And... Obviously, Brewer was never the most prolific passer. He was never the most efficient guy. He was never the guy that was going to throw for 400 yards and five touchdowns and put the team on his back to carry you to a victory. But he was stable. I say was. He is a stable quarterback who doesn't make a whole lot of mistakes, and he plays hard-nosed football. Now, concussions plagued him. Obviously, an unfortunate trajectory towards the end of his career at Baylor, but he's a guy uh, that definitely has a future elsewhere, if only for one season. He will transfer. He's entered the transfer portal. That is the news out of Waco this morning. So Brewer is headed to another program to play what would presumably be the final season of his collegiate football career. Now, John... What do you think of the move from Brewer? And do you have any designs, any ideas on where he might end up? 
I'm su this caught me by surprise, honestly. I watched that game yesterday, and you heard the commentators uh, during the game talk several times about Charlie Brewer coming back for another another year next year, a, a second senior year. So this caught me by surprise a little bit. Um, I, you know, Zeno was the guy. Remember in the Big Twelve championship game uh, last year that kind of kind of rallied them a little bit, threw a couple of deep balls, hit Tristan Tristan Ebner, I think, on one of them, and. Um, got them in position to win the game after Brewer went out on the hit from uh, Kenneth Murray with a concussion. I don't know. I, I honestly, I mean, where I, I, I just assumed, as he said in his uh, in his tweet, uh, Baylor for life or something like that, um, but not going to finish his career there. So where's he going to go? Is he going to be like the next Shane Buchel that goes to SMU, puts up a bunch of big numbers and wow some people? Uh, Maybe he's going to go to Texas Tech and compete. You know, does he want to stay in the conference? Does he want to get out of the conference? Uh, there's some, there's going to be some quality teams next year with, uh, with you know, in, on the mid-major level, some group of five teams that need a quarterback. Um, shoot, who knows? Tulsa might be one of them. You know, uh, Zach Smith, I think, is a senior this year at TU. So hey, there's a lot of opportunities. Um, that could be one that's interesting because I think Charlie Brewer was a guy that Philip Montgomery recruited heavily before he signed with Baylor. Um, but we'll see. I mean, that's, there's no way to, no way to predict, uh, accurately what Charlie Brewer is going to do, but it does catch me by surprise quite a bit. Here's another thing to keep in mind here, John. I think we've all been under the impression for most of this year, uh, that Tanner Mordecai probably isn't going to finish his collegiate career sooner. He's a Waco native and there's no clear starting quarterback anymore in Waco at Baylor university. So does Tanner Mordecai look at making a move back home? He's set to graduate. He'll have two years of eligibility left. It's certainly a possibility and something to keep an eye on because Dave Aranda heading into his second season as Baylor head coach will no doubt be trying to figure out some answers for what his team is going to look like offensively. Obviously, he's a defensive-minded guy, but you want to make sure that your offense has a stable leader, the likes of Charlie Brewer, at the quarterback position. And if it's not Charlie Brewer, who's it going to be? It might be Jacob Zeno, might be Kyron Drones, but they could very well look at bringing in a guy like Tanner Mordecai if he indeed enters the transfer portal at some point. Let's talk OU basketball. John, the Sooners went on the road on Wednesday and got shellacked by Xavier, 99-77. to And they didn't play bad basketball. They shot the ball at over 50% uh, from the floor. Unfortunately, the Musketeers set a school record with 19 three-pointers in that contest, getting seven of them from guard Nate Johnson, Gardner Webb transfer. He went seven of nine from behind the arc, so really nothing the Sooners could do. You just chalk it up to the other team being hot from the field, and that happens from time to time, John. But the Sooners were able to recover yesterday, Saturday, with a victory over Florida A&M on their home I almost said turf. They don't play basketball on turf, John. They play it on the hardwood. <laughs> but they returned to the Lloyd Noble Center, defeated Florida A&M, very workmanlike victory. No one guy really stood out. Kirk Queth led the way with 14 points and matched a career high with eight rebounds. One point of note, though, Brady Manick hit his 200th career three-pointer, becoming the tallest player in Big 12 history to do so and just the sixth player in Sooner history. To do it, John. The tallest player to in Big Twelve history. What a di what a distinction for Brady. Wow. Um, that game yesterday, last night. Uh, I guess it was yesterday afternoon. Um, I was go flipping back and forth between the Oklahoma State game, Oklahoma State Baylor, and uh, the OU Rattlers um, basketball game. Five players in double figures. That's what I mean. That's got to be the identity of this team for me. You got to get some scoring out of your one-two punch and Manic and Reeves, but somebody somewhere has to has to contribute points that you might not expect. Um, and I'm not so sure that you're going to be able to do that on a consistent basis. You're not going to have a third option on a consistent basis. Um, you're going to have a lot of third options this year if you're Lon Kruger, and I think we saw one of them. Uh, yesterday, and that's Kirk Queth. What a, what a, you know, when he gets out and runs, um, he, listen, now, first of all, he did have some decided uh, skill advantage, ta uh, size advantage, physical gift advantage over the Rattlers. 
But uh, that's what you need out of out of guys like you know elsewhere on the bench for Oklahoma. You're going to need um, you know Phipps to come out and hit four three pointers. You're going to need a, somebody else at some point, whether it's Alondis Williams or Davion Harmon or somebody like that, to score 15, 16, 18 points on a, on a given night. I don't think you can get 20, 25 out of the top two guys, Manic and Reeves, every night. So what we saw the other night, what we saw yesterday, probably about right. Probably about right. Get five, get five guys scoring, spread it around. You know, you win easily. It's a, it's not a, not a big, huge. Uh, what was it? A thirty-point win or something like that. Um, so it's, it's not. There's not a lot of stress in that game. There's going to be games coming up though where you're going to be a little more stressed, and you're going to have to narrow that down. Who that third option and fourth option are going to be. Next up for the Sooners is another home date with Oral Roberts that comes on Wednesday. National Signing Day is also on Wednesday, and we're going to talk all the prominent storylines as it creeps closer and closer. That comes your way next on the SI Sooners podcast. Hey there, loyal listeners. Parker Thune here with SI Sooners. Are you a business owner looking to get your product out there to the masses? Let's say you run a hotel in Norman, or a car dealership in Oklahoma City, or a restaurant in Edmond. Or maybe you're just a small online business who creates and sells OU merchandise, and you want Sooner Nation to come sample your wares. Consider advertising in this space right here on the SI Sooners podcast. SI Sooners reaches thousands of readers, viewers, and listeners literally every day, and the SI Sooners podcast is the ideal place to find your next customer. To advertise, send an email to allsoonerssi at gmail.com, or send us a direct message on Twitter at all underscore Sooners. John, before we jump into some recruiting talk here on the SI Sooners podcast, uh, let's make mention of this. The women's basketball team for the Sooners took the court each of their last two games, Thursday and then this afternoon against Texas, Ta- uh, Texas State, rather, with six players and very nearly went 2-0. They traveled up to Fog Allen Fieldhouse on Thursday, down their two starting forwards in Mandy Simpson and Maddie Williams, and very nearly toppled the Kansas Jayhawks. Kansas eventually pulled away late to win that contest. But they played with six again today against the Bobcats of Texas State. Came out victorious there, 52-40. to That's impressive, John. What Sherry Cole's team was able to pull off is impressive because to get through an entire game, not, not only to get through an entire game, but to win a game and to play as well as the Sooners did in each of those contests with only six players. Got to tip your cap to those ladies. Absolutely. Six players. You know what that means, right? Six players. In basketball, you play with five. You got one sub. You got to play a 40-minute game with one sub, and they did that back-to-back games. So hats off. Sherry Cole said the other night, I couldn't be more proud of this team. Uh, she said, I, th- I think it was more along the lines, I couldn't be more proud of the six players that are out here. Wow. Uh, Gabby Gregory scored 22 the other night. I think she had 16 today. Listen, um, OU's taken a beating on the floor and uh, in the headlines and in the fan base for the last three or four years, and probably rightfully so. Their, their recruiting has dropped off. Their talent has dropped off, but they're fighting. And to me, I'm, try- I'm not trying to be you know Joe Cheerleader here. I like to see a team that's scrappy. I like to see a team that fights. I like to see a team that doesn't back down. And this OU team, listen, Sherry's right. They're they're not backing down. They're fighting through this thing. So six players, um, that's not good. That's not ideal. But if you go one and one in a week when you only have six players available, that ain't too bad. All right, John, let's jump into recruiting and let's start with what we had on Friday night, the commitment from Emeka Egbuka, the number 10 overall prospect in SI All-Americans 2021 class rankings and the number one overall wide receiver Now, John, we knew it was going to come down to Ohio State and Oklahoma. Last week podcast, I told you that I was confident it was going to be Oklahoma, although I didn't really have definitive word one way or another. But my belief was that he was going to commit to Oklahoma. Lo and behold, he commits to Ohio State. And let me tell you, John, I heard about it on social media from the Ohio State faithful. They are merciless (laughs) because they dug up that tweet where I said I believed that Emeka Egbuka was going to commit to the Sooners <laughs> over the Buckeyes, and they had a field day 
with that one. I tell you what, I fielded a lot yeah. of not so nice DMs and comments and various other <laughs> messages across many social platforms. They dug me up on every social media platform, John. I give them props for being so thorough. Man. But the Buckeyes land Egbuka, Oklahoma denied an opportunity to reel in a fourth high profile wide receiver. In this 2021 class, of course, they have Mario Williams, they have Jalil Farouk, they have Cody Jackson, and you figure Billy Bowman gets some time at wideout too, although he is committed as an athlete. Sooners also lost out on Remington Strickland, the center out of Texas. Uh, on Friday night, he committed to Texas A&M just about an hour before Egbuka made his announcement. Now, as we head into National Signing Day, John, there's really not a lot of intrigue. You look at the 15 commits that Oklahoma already has on the books, none of them really seem like they're going to waffle one way or another. You look at those 15 guys and say, okay, they're solidly committed. You know you got Bryce Foster's decision on the 18th. You got Kamar Wheaton's decision on the 23rd. Tristan Lee and Jardin Gilbert commit in January. So really the only guy hanging out there that you wonder about, and you're not at all sure, I don't think any of us are sure at this point where he's leaning, is Savion Bird, the offensive lineman out of Duncanville who is committing on National Signing Day. He will announce in a televised decision Oklahoma, LSU, Auburn, and SMU in the running for his pledge. John, you got any idea what Bird's thinking and what kind of a player could Oklahoma be getting in Bird? How big would he be for this class should he commit to Oklahoma? Before I talk about Savion Bird, I'm going to have to back up Parker and tell you that, man, I should have I should have told you to brace for the storm when you said Oklahoma was going to get a recruit over Ohio State, just in case he chose Ohio State. I think the 24-7 guys had him as a 90% prospect most of the week going to Ohio State, their crystal ball. I get that. But, Parker, all the years I wrote for the Tulsa World, I think one of the all-time most trafficy days, one of the biggest – spikes we ever had in traffic online traffic was the was the was the blog that i wrote Every, okay so i've been a heisman trophy voter since 1998 i wrote and every year i write a blog explaining why i voted for this person why i didn't vote for that person i think the busiest blog the busiest traffic we ever had was the one where troy smith was the runaway winner for the heisman trophy ohio state quarterback Runaway. And I wrote a little blog column explaining why I didn't vote for him, why I didn't even have him on my ballot. Oh my God, the Ohio State people came after me. I thought they were, I, I got like death threats for not voting for Troy Smith. Not, there, there was nothing fun about it. There was nothing in jest. It was, I hope you die. I hope everyone you know dies. Don't ever come to, to Columbus because we will kill you. It was serious. It was bad. Um, so the Bucknuts, I should have told you, will be out in force if you're predicting Emeka Egbuk <laughs> will go to OU instead of Ohio State. That kind of stands up for, for anything football-wise. Um, I don't know, man. I can't get a read on, on Savion Bird um, other than, you know, when I sat down with him for almost a half hour back in August. And I thought he was a lock for Oklahoma. That was still early in the recruiting process, I guess, for him. Still in the, when you start me measuring in unofficial visits and, uh, you know, virtual visits and, you know, whatever, you know, coaches get their fingers in you kind of thing. Sounded like he was going to Oklahoma and I would have bet like a lot. I would have bet a lot when I left that interview that this kid is going to Oklahoma. He sounded like he loved OU. He's from, uh, he's from North Texas. You know, he's a guy that, uh, you know, he comes from Georgia now. But he relocated to North Texas, and OU started showing him some love, and I think he started showing it back. He's a guy that uh, he's going to – when you listen to what he says uh, and you listen to the way he says it about the team, about his recruitment, about the virtual stuff, about his family, uh, about the commitment that he's going to make to a school and vice versa, you get the sense that he's, he's, going, to, he's going to make somebody a really, really good offensive lineman. So – Four or five years down the road, somebody's going to be very happy. And I think there's going to be a few teams that are disappointed. I still think it's OU. I do. Um, and I, I, I have nothing to go on other than my early conversation. But, man, he sure seemed solid to OU at that time. And I know things change, but, you know, we'll have to wait and see.
things certainly do change, John. Now, I can say most certainly that Savion Bird will not be committing to Ohio State. Now, Buckeyes fans, <laughs> if I turn out to be wrong, you're more than welcome to come at come me again. Some. But it does not look like Savion Bird will be a Buckeye. We know that uh, with some degree of certainty. Now, we will have signing day coverage for you all week, but most specifically on Wednesday for you over on allsooners.com. All day long, John and I will be pushing stuff out, keeping you updated on the Sooners signees, who signs and when, taking a look at the guys that are still question marks. Of course, Bird really the only legitimate question mark. Who knows? Maybe the Sooners pick up an extra commit or two. Maybe they lose a guy or two. There's no telling once signing day rolls around, but that's why we will be on top of it all day long for you at allsooners.com. I'll add this to wait until you guys see the stuff that Parker has been doing. He's been in on this recruiting since he joined the staff in March. Uh, he has been compiling some serious work on these recruits. I can say this, you guys are going to love it. You're going to love the, the recruiting, the National Signing Day package that Parker has put together. It's big time. You can listen to the SI Sooners podcast wherever you get your podcasts, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Apple Music, I believe, question mark, not at all sure. I don't know. There's so many there are so many podcast streaming platforms these days, it's hard for me to keep up. But just know, whatever podcast streaming platform you use, there is a great probability that we are on it thanks to John's fantastic work on pushing us out there. And, of course, you can watch the SI Sooners podcast if you prefer the YouTube route. You can go to John's channel at John Hoover Media on YouTube uh, to take a look at us over there. And, of course, stay up to date all week with us for National Signing Day coverage and so much more with the Big 12 Championship just days away. For John Hoover, I am Parker Thune. This is the SI Sooners podcast. We'll see you next time.